Welcome to the Economist in Your Ear podcast. Can a powerful nation um, intentionally choose inefficiency, except huge operational costs, if the ultimate payoff is, say, guaranteed self-reliance and maybe even technological survival? That really is the massive trade-off we're looking at today, isn't it? We're digging into the U.S. export controls, the ones meant to block China from getting those super advanced ships, you know, the semiconductors vital for modern AI. Right. The goal was pretty clear. Slow China down technologically. Yeah, put the brakes on. And uh, the initial thinking was maybe China's AI efforts would just collapse or at least stall out pretty badly. But what we're actually seeing on the ground is, well, much more interesting. It seems instead of folding, Chinese industry is innovating like really rapidly around these limits. They're trying to build a whole domestic AI tech stack yeah. pretty much from the ground up or at least right. piece it together differently. Exactly. The narrative playing out is that China's managing to build what you might call a good enough domestic solution. It involves stretching existing tools, scaling systems way up, maybe beyond what seems sensible, and um, leaning heavily on specialized software tricks. Okay. But what we really want to do here is apply a critical lens. Does this good enough idea actually hold up against the real engineering and physics constraints? Or does it kind of gloss over some deep structural problems? Okay, let's unpack that. Starting with the hardware side, the sheer ingenuity. U.S. pressure means China can't get ASML's top tier EUV machines, right? Yeah. Extreme ultraviolet lithography. Correct. Those use 13.5 nanometer light, like an ultra fine pen for drawing circuits. Without them, Chinese firms like SMIC, their big chip maker, they have to rely on older DUV systems, deep ultraviolet. Which use 193 nanometer light, so a much thicker marker, basically. Precisely. The physics just makes it incredibly hard for DUV who efficiently draw the tiny lines needed for today's cutting edge chips, you know, the five nanometer or three nanometer stuff. So how do they get around that? It sounds like a fundamental physical limit. Well, they use this technique called multi-patterning. It's clever, if complicated. Instead of one pass with the light source, they essentially uh, expose the silicon wafer multiple times. Repeating the process lets them etch lines finer than the light's wavelength would normally allow. Wow. Okay, that sounds like some serious engineering under pressure. It absolutely is. And this method, it actually allowed SMIC to get to commercial 7 nanometer production, which is a real achievement given the constraints. So here's where that cost of independence you mentioned kicks in, right? Multi-patterning can't be cheap or easy. Not at all. It dramatically slows down production. Think about aligning that wafer perfectly multiple times. And critically, it tanks your yield, the percentage of good chips you get off each wafer. More steps mean more chances for errors. So self-sufficiency wins, but efficiency takes a big hit. It costs more, takes longer. Exactly. And while they hit 7 nanometers, which is significant, most analysts are pretty skeptical about large-scale, high-volume 5 nanometer production using just DUV. It seems years away, and even then, it'll likely be way more expensive than how TSMC does it with EUV. That gap in transistor tech it's still a major hurdle. Okay, so closing that gap directly is tough for now. Strategy two then seems to be yeah. quantity over quality. If your individual chip isn't the fastest, just use, well, a whole lot more of them. Mm -hmm. Huawei's main AI chip, the Ascend 910C, it delivers around 800 TFLOPs. That's respectable, but NVIDIA's latest, the B200, is way up at maybe 2,500 TFLOPs. A big difference. So Huawei's response is system level. Yes, they leverage their deep background in networking. They've launched this thing called the Cloud Matrix 384. It literally links 384 of those Ascend 910C chips together into one enormous computing system. 384 chips compared to, say, NVIDIA's big systems like the GB200 NVL72, which uses 72 chips, mm -hmm. that's a huge difference in scale. It is. And they're apparently using optical networking pulses of light to shuffle data between all those chips instead of just traditional electrical signals. That plays right into Huawei's strengths and could potentially shift how people think about designing AI infrastructure. Interesting. OK, strategy three then. Fuzzy math and co-design. If the hardware is lagging, make the software and the math problems easier for it. You got it. AI models, especially large language models, are surprisingly tolerant of a bit of imprecision. They don't always need perfect calculations like, say, a physics simulation. So you can tailor the hardware and software together really closely. Exactly. We saw DeepSeek, a big Chinese AI lab, release a new number format. It's just 8-bit, super simple. Crucially, it drops negative numbers and complex fractions. Why does that work for AI? seems limiting. Because often in these models, it's the magnitude or the strength of a connection that matters most, not whether it's precisely plus 0.75 or mona 0.2. 
Simplifying the numbers makes the math much faster and uses less power on less capable chips. Ah, so it's an efficiency play. A big one. And you saw chip designers like Cambricon Technologies, their value shot up because their processors already support these kinds of specialized, low precision formats. It shows that hardware software synergy is actually happening. It's uh, described as a simple but really effective optimization. Okay, so we've got the workarounds complex multi patterning, massive scaling, and this clever, fuzzy math. But let's pause and bring in that critical lens you mentioned, starting with. TFLOPs just comparing raw calculation speed. Why is that a trap? It's totally a trap. TFLOPs are like like the engine horsepower in a race car. Yeah. Impressive, yes. But training a huge LLM involves constantly moving enormous amounts of data petabytes around. The engine needs fuel fast. So the bottleneck isn't the engine speed, it's the fuel line. Precisely. For training these giant models, the real limits are memory bandwidth. How fast can you get data into the chip and the interconnect? How fast can data move between chips and memory? Scale and latency matter hugely. And the biggest physical bottleneck there seems to be this specialized memory, HBM, high bandwidth memory. Absolutely. HBM. It's that stacked memory sitting right next to the AI chip, super fast. And here's, well, here's a major snag in the self-reliance narrative. China is still dependent on non-Chinese companies for HBM. We're talking SK, Hynix, Samsung, Micron. Okay. If you can't get enough fast HBM, that whole quantity over quality strategy, linking 384 chips together, it kind of hits a physics wall. Those chips might be theoretically fast, but if they're just sitting there idle, waiting for data your overall system efficiency just plummets. And that sheer scale, the 384 chip system, that introduces another huge risk, doesn't it? Operational risk. Oh, definitely. That huge optical design from Huawei, it actually reminds me of concepts. NVIDIA itself explored systems like NVL256, Ranger, but NVIDIA didn't really push them into mass production oh, I... because the trade-offs were just brutal. Mm. Costs, enormous power draw, and crucially, reliability. That Huawei cloud matrix system, it reportedly draws something like 600 kilowatts of power. 600 kilowatts, that's huge. Yeah. It's more than four times the equivalent NVIDIA system. Just managing the heat, the power, and keeping all those optical links perfectly aligned and running. The system engineering challenge is immense. Reliability, keeping utilization high, that's going to be the real swing factor here. Yeah, I mean, just basic maintenance. If one optical connection gets flaky or one chip in that giant array fails, does it just cripple the whole training job? It absolutely can. At that scale, reliability, uh, mean time between failures, repair times, they become paramount. If your amazing system is down 30% of the time for fixes, well, You've lost all your theoretical gains. It's an operational nightmare waiting to happen, potentially. And we should probably challenge that idea that energy is just not a problem in China. Yes, they build a lot of power plants, but... Right, it's not that simple. National demand is soaring. And these massive AI clusters don't just need raw kilowatt hours. They need high quality, stable, predictable power right where the labs are, not necessarily out where the wind farms are. So power is available, sure. But it's definitely not free or unlimited when you need to run hundreds of these 600 kilowatt monsters, 247. Okay, so HPM dependency, reliability at scale, power quality. These are serious constraints. They're systemic. They go beyond just the chip itself. Which brings us to another big one. Yeah. The software mode. Yeah. Even if you get the hardware working, people need to be able to code for it easily, right? Exactly. And NVIDIA's CDA platform is still, you know, the king. It's mature. It's robust. Huge developer community. Tons of libraries built over years. And the Chinese alternatives. Yeah. Huawei has Canon and Mindspore. Yeah, and they're getting better, no doubt. Canon is going open source. Labs like DevSeeker supporting it. But improving isn't the same as mature or stable, especially mm -hmm. compared to CEO. Industry reports still point out gaps in stability and maturity migrating huge, complex AI workloads, which often rely on very specific, low-level CDA routines, that's not easy. It takes years of really painful debugging and rewriting code. That software lock-in is a massive hurdle for labs wanting to switch entirely to domestic hardware. And finally, the policy wall itself. It's not quite a solid wall, is it? It seems more fluid negotiated almost. That's a great way to put it. Look at NVIDIA's H20 chip designed specifically for China under the restrictions. Washington initially blocked it, then apparently reversed course and allowed sales, maybe with some kind of unusual revenue sharing deal. Mm. That fluidity really messes with the straightforward forced self-reliance narrative. If Chinese labs can still get some restricted NVIDIA chips, even if they're not the absolute best, 
Well, that takes the immediate pressure off. It slows down that difficult, urgent migration away from CDA. Because the familiar, stable option is still partially available. Exactly. If these kinds of limited openings continue, they offer tempting short-term solutions that could actually delay the full commitment to the domestic alternatives. Okay, so let's pull this all together. Yeah. We have the ingenuity, multi-patterning, massive scaling, clever math tricks. But then we have these serious constraints. HBM, system reliability, the software mode, even the fluid policy. Where does that leave the good enough domestic stack right now? Well, it seems the domestic stack is actually finding success in one key area, influence, running models that are already trained. That seems to be getting much more cost competitive using domestic chips, especially with that 8-bit math adoption. OK, so running existing AI is getting cheaper domestically. Right. But the big bottleneck, the really hard part, cutting edge training, building the next generation of huge foundation models that still look severely constrained. HBM supply is probably limiter number one. Then the operational maturity of those complex interconnects for massive scale out. And don't forget, they still rely on American EDA tools, the software used to design the chips in the first place. So if we want to track whether this self-sufficient model is really working long term, what should we what should you be watching? What are the key indicators beyond just headlines? Yeah, good question. Forget the TFLP's marketing for a moment. I'd watch four things closely. First, Concrete proof of five nanometer chips made in volume by SMIC using DUV. We need real independent teardowns showing it's happening reliably, not just a lab demo. Is DUV truly defying physics at scale? Okay, proof of five millimeter volume production. What's second? Second, any sign of domestic HBM import replacement. If China starts sourcing high yield, high performance HBM from its own suppliers, that is potentially the biggest game changer. It breaks their most critical foreign dependency for training. Got it. Domestic HBM. Third. Third, we need real operational data on those huge Huawei optical megapods. What are the actual uptime numbers, the utilization rates? Does the complexity kill the perform performance gains in practice? If utilization is only, say, 60%, the whole economic case might collapse. Makes sense. Reliability in the real world. And fourth. Fourth, watch the developers. Are they really migrating to CAN-N and MindSpore? Look at developer forums, GitHub activity. Are we seeing sustained use of stable features? Are the complaints about crashes, overheating, instability genuinely decreasing? That's your ground truth on whether the software mode is actually being bridged. It's an absolutely fascinating high stakes technological race, isn't it? China's tech industry might not need to be the absolute world's best to serve its national goals, especially if computing is seen as critical national security infrastructure. That's a key point. Good enough might be perfectly fine for certain national priorities. But the ultimate success of this whole self-reliance push, it won't just hinge on clever hardware tricks. It rests on solving the, frankly, boring but incredibly difficult problems of high volume manufacturing yields, making complex systems reliable day in, day out, and achieving true software stability and usability at massive scale. That's where the gamble lies, I suppose. Is the high cost of independence a smart long-term investment, or does it become an overwhelming operational burden? Precisely. That's the question time will answer. Thanks for listening. Follow us for daily insights into world affairs, and don't forget to like, comment, and share.